Nicotine. And we have a great program for you this evening that brings together two people, especially well-read in military and world history, to talk about how what our founding fathers learned from the Greeks and Romans ended up influencing them and shaping our country. For those of you not familiar with how this virtual format works, uh, you'll still be able to ask a question if you'd like. To do so, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screens. The chat function also will be active. And in that column, you'll find a link for purchasing a copy of this evening's featured book, First Principles by Thomas Ricks. Uh, it's quite a, a treat, uh, especially for me this evening, uh, to uh, introduce Tom. He and I covered the Pentagon together at the Washington Post. Uh, and when you partner with someone on a beat like that, you get to know his work very well. I was and, and have remained uh, a keen admirer of Tom's reporting talents, his ability to sift through lots of information and focus on what's really important, and his clear and fluid writing style. Tom covered the US military as a newspaper man for more than a decade and a half, first for the Wall Street Journal and then for the Post. During his time on the Pentagon beat, he received two Pulitzer Prizes as a member of reporting teams. Leaving daily journalism a dozen years ago, he moved to Maine, but continued writing about military affairs on online blogs and now serves as military history columnist for the New York Times Book Review. I also always knew Tom to be a, an avid reader. And while still a daily reporter, he started writing his own books, Making the core provided an inside look at Marine training, and Tom's novel, A Soldier's Duty, offered a fictional glimpse into what a politicized officer corps might look like. Two subsequent best-selling books on the Iraq War, First Fiasco and then The Gamble, went a long way towards exposing how poorly the US occupation was being run. In The Generals, eight years ago, Tom delivered a searing indictment of the top ranks of America's armed forces. And in Churchill and Orwell three years ago, he offered a dual biography of how those two historical British figures confronted 20th century authoritarianism in their own ways while promoting the primacy of individual freedom and critical thought. Now in First Principles, Tom explores how the classical educations of the first four US presidents, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison influenced their thinking and ultimately the contours of American democracy. Reviews have praised the book as enlightening, lucid, entertaining, and particularly, particularly relevant at a time when we're all struggling in this country with how to get back to basic principles. And Tom, at the end of the book, has a helpful practical chapter titled, What We Can Do. Here to talk with Tom is retired General James Mattis, who spent 44 years in the Marine Corps before serving two years as Defense Secretary under very trying circumstances in the Trump administration. Over the years, uh, Jim has gained a reputation as one of the most well-read and experienced military commanders of our time. Now a fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution, he released a book last year, Call Sign Chaos, recounting his foundational experiences as a leader. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Tom Ricks and General Jim Mattis. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Bradley. It's a pleasure to support uh, Politics and Prose, especially when it's a book by Tom Ricks, especially when it's a book so fit for our time. And I've got to ask you, Tom, starting off, uh, how could you have thought up a subject that years later when you brought the book out would be exactly what the nation needed as has been pointed out in a number of the reviews of your fine work? I mean, what was it that drove you to write this book? What started you on it? And what kept you on what had to be just a phenomenal research effort to put this together? Thank you. And thank you for being here tonight. And, and by the way, uh, given your 44 years, happy Veterans Day. Uh, how this book began, uh, it began four years ago, almost exactly, uh, with the election of Donald Trump as president. I was simply stunned by that. I went to bed and then the next morning, a gray morning here in Maine, it was a Wednesday morning, 
I said, I don't understand what just happened. I don't understand how it happened, why it happened. I don't understand what my fellow Americans are thinking. And I better do some work here to start understanding it. And I've been taught whenever you have a real problem, go back to first principles, go back to fundamentals. So I thought, what could be more fundamental than Aristotle's politics? I went down to my library, took it out and sat down and began to read it in the context of America today. And it's very good in dissecting basic political systems. And by the way, we can get into this later. I came away thinking we live not quite in a democracy these days, but in an oligarchy, uh, rule of the rich, uh, with the trappings of democracy, call it a democratic oligarchy, in which the top 1% of this country, uh, through campaign finance, are deciding what happens in terms of policy. So I delved into this from Aristotle, and I started reading other ancient works, and then I began picking up how often, reading history, uh, the founders of America were mentioned as people who were steeped in this, uh, much more than, say, for example, in the works of John Locke or the English Enlightenment, um, that they were really focused on ancient Rome and in the background, ancient Greece. And especially with Rome, the decline of the Roman Republic, that for them was the key political event in world history. And it had an urgency for them. It was front page news. Why did the Roman Republic decline? Why did the general Julius Caesar eventually take over? Uh, are republics sustainable was one of the questions they had, uh, especially James Madison. How do you design a republic that can last, that's sustainable? If America turns out to be a really big country and they thought it would, can you have a big republic? And they looked again and again to the ancient world for the answers to that. And so when you have the Constitutional Convention, and they're talking about how to have states represented, they said, let's have a Senate, a Roman term. <clears throat> and they ultimately decided, let's ha have each state, whether big or small, be represented by two senators. Why? Because that's the way the ancient Greeks did it with the, if I can remember the word correctly, Amphicatonic League, uh, which was kind of the NATO of its day. Uh, and in that league or confederation of ancient Greek city-states, both the big city-states and the small ones had two votes, which is why little Wyoming today has as many senators as California, though even though California has, I believe, 50 times the number of voters. So that's uh, the questions I sort of were trying to figure out, how did we get here? What do these guys do when they design the house we live in? And have we lived up to what they expected? Would they be surprised if they saw where we are today? Uh, now, General Adam, uh, General uh, Mattis, I'd like to turn to you with a question as we come out of this. I was thinking about this today. Hmm. John Adams was the first president to be denied re-election. He had to turn power over to the opposition and he did so peacefully. Now, being John Adams, he also was cranky about it. Uh, he, he declined to attend Thomas Jefferson's inauguration. He caught the 4 a.m. coach to Baltimore and left town. Uh, given that, would you care to comment on the current situation? No, no, Tom, we're here to talk with you about the book, but let me say one other thing. Uh, uh, starting about seven elections ago uh, in our country, retired generals began taking sides, endorsing candidates and parties. It was a handful, not even a handful that first time, and it's grown to hundreds now of competing lists. And I think when you look at the Republic, when you look at what George Washington envisioned uh, and look at what happened at Newburgh and the mutiny there, or near mutiny. When you read George C. Marshall's style of leadership, there's an apolitical tradition where many senior officers today in the military do not vote for president. They vote for senators and congressmen and mayor and this sort of thing, but they don't want to vote for president, so they don't even have a sense that their person won or lost. I bring this up because elections are all about division in the country. You divide, you, 
you fight it out over policies. Uh, sometimes they're not real civil. Welcome to democracy. Uh, I think during election season, when that's going on, generals who have such supreme authority on the battlefield and over their troops need to retire their tongues when they retire their uniforms during election season. Uh, I don't think it's wise to have generals endorsing candidates. We need that apolitical tradition if we're going to have some officers given that, that, uh, that authority. Uh, for example, Bradley, when you kindly introduced me uh, tonight, you called me general. Uh, I can like it or not, but you did not call me Jim or secretary or mister, and I'm a general forever. So when it comes to governance, uh, unifying the country, once an election's over, then everybody needs to roll up their sleeves and work together. And general, that includes generals. But during elections, I'll leave the commentary to the professionals, Tom, like you. Another question well, for you, though. I, I actually want to respond to you on this because it actually takes us back into the book. The founders were very concerned with exactly the question you're talking about. And boy, I think they would applaud what you just said. Uh, they had in not living memory, but recent historical memory, the experience, the history of Cromwell leading a rebellion in England against the king chopping the king's head off. And he was a general, and then he became a dictator. Mm -hmm. They also knew in their uh, study of Roman history how central Julius Caesar, another general, was. Uh, so they really did fear generals taking over. And that's one reason, again, for the importance of George Washington stepping down at the end of the war, giving up power, and actually bowing to Congress. Mm -hmm formally bowing when he turned in his commission, Congress did not rise because Congress was superior. And that's something we really need to keep in mind in this country, the importance of civilian authority over the military. So I applaud you for what you're saying. Uh, listening, uh, listening to that and my own reading, I think all the way through an inauguration, generals stay silent until what the people uh, have ordained is actually uh, sworn in at inauguration time into office. A question for you, Tom. Uh, you dedicated the book, and I'll read the dedication here, for the dissenters who conceived this nation and improve it still. Just knowing, uh, having written one book myself, my first and last, I might add, um, you get to the end of the book and you have to think about that. Who are you going to dedicate it to? You may have thought about it while it was going, but now it's time to, to actually write it down. Why did you dedicate it to the dissenters? As I said, because they're the people who conceived this country. And I think I wanted to emphasize the necessity of honoring dissent, of listening to the opposition, uh, of understanding that there's a common good in the country in discussing differences, but also wanting to, to, to make progress. Uh, we can't have a democracy if we don't have dissenters. You've got to, to have an election. You've got to have two people who say, no, elect me, no, elect me. And so I really am in awe of people who put themselves out there and run for office. Between primaries and general elections, the vast majority of people who put up their hand and run for office lose. And I think it's a patriotic service to run for office, knowing that most of those people are gonna lose. So I, I think we need to honor dissent in this country. Uh, we need to especially honor the First Amendment. One of the things I mentioned at the end is a congressional candidate who slugs a reporter asking him a question is acting in an un-American way. So too, College students who won't allow somebody to speak on a campus because they don't like that point of view are acting in an un-American way. And we can look to the Constitution, to the Bill of Rights, to tell us what is American and what is not. The most American thing you can do is vote. This country is built on the vote. And I think that may be one reason this book is resonating so much with people. I've been surprised, honestly, uh, at the sales of this book this, this week as it came out. I think my editors have too. I think people are scrambling to say, we better print more of this thing. Uh, but the dissenters, man, they are, they are the core of this country. And, they're, and I'm talking about dissenters on the right as well as the left. Um, we really need to make sure that, 
dissenting voices are heard and are honored. Uh, but also, I would add, when a judge says, you know, I've heard your dissent and I'm, and I'm disagreeing, time to move on. Yeah, I, I would agree. Once the election's over, it's time to unify. You can you run for office basically on division, but you govern through unity. <clears throat> and for Ira, who just asked, why well, didn't I, uh, didn't I endorse Trump for the election? No, I have never endorsed any political candidate in my life, uh, nor will I even now. I had never met Mr. Trump. Uh, before reading on CNN that he was not wanted to see me about being the Secretary of Defense. But Tom, I, I also want to point out, uh, I'm not surprised at the books uh, catch on people's attention, not at all. Uh, in reading the book, uh, Tom, I got a sense of continuity that frankly I'd been lacking. I did not understand all the points you bring out through your research that show where these ideas came from and the arguments about how to apply those ideas in this experiment that you and I call America. And I bring that up because we're at a point in time when many people, I think, are doubting our values. They're, they're not confident that our values really are uh, human rights, that they are written in a way where America won't always have it right, but we have a chance to get it right because of the way in which they set that government up. They may have overrated public virtue. They may have done so. But at the same time, I would just tell you that we live in the age when instead of doubting our values, I think we need to doubt our doubts. And your book is confidence building on that. How do you respond to this? Because I think doubting Western values right now is somewhat in vogue in some places. There's no question that these guys got a lot of things wrong. Uh, they did uh, think that you could build a country on virtue. And they found out pretty fast and hard during the American Revolution that simply relying on public spiritedness, what they called virtue, that wasn't gonna work. Uh, they also, because they were so focused on Roman history, had a terrible fear of faction and so of partisanship and political parties. And most of all, they terribly got wrong the issue of race in America. Uh, People say slavery is a stain on, a, on American, the fabric of America. No, slavery was woven into that fabric. And one reason we're still having these issues of race 200 years, 250 years later, is because we still have not pulled out the threat of racism from the American fabric. Uh, one of the things I'd say that the book tries to look at is what America aspires to be and what it is. And there's always a gap there. Uh, the Declaration of Independence is a great statement of aspirations. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yet, here we are 250 years later, uh, and black people again and again do not find equal justice before the law, especially equal justice before the police officer on the street. Uh, for a variety of reasons, I've been going back and reading a lot of civil rights history and it is stunning to me that how much of America basically was dedicated to an authoritarian subjugation of black people, holding them in a position of second class citizenship through the exercise of local and state power for decades upon decades. Uh, it was a real effort to maintain segregation with a constant uh, use of violence and the threat of violence. So, I kind of look back at what do these guys try to design and what would they think if they saw us today? Would they be pleased with how it came out? Would they think that we had succeeded? And I, I think in many ways, yes. They, I think actually uh, they would please, they'd be pleased to see how, first of all, that the country has survived. Uh, partly because of the way they screwed up race and slavery, this country nearly blew apart, had a terrific civil war. Uh, and as I think we're still in reconstruction from that civil war. Uh, I'll leave it there. Yeah, it, it, uh, it, but it goes to the heart of what they tried to set up, the aspirations and the gap between that and, for example, the birth defect that we were born with uh, because they did get it wrong. 
on that. In some ways, your book actually reminds me, I think the book was written in 1941 of John Dos, uh, Dos Passos, and it's called uh, The Ground We Stand On. He's got some profiles in there, very interesting ones, but the one that you wrote about that really struck me was Madison, the person that you put in there uh, and you, you see him playing a much more significant role than I've ever picked up from my admittedly probably inadequate uh, reading uh, about this period. Uh, you find him, I think the word you use, brilliant and underappreciated uh, is the way you see Madison. Uh, tell us more and why, why you came to this uh, conclusion, because I went back and read about him in some other books, and again, he just he does not come across uh, the way with the fulsome reputation that you find he should have re rightly been recognized for. Uh, the place to begin, I, you and I seem to always be exchanging book recommendations. The, I think the best single biography of James Madison is by Richard Brookheiser. Uh, unlike a lot of academic historians, Brookheiser has a real feel for politics. And you can't understand James Madison unless you understand he was both a brilliant political theorist and a brilliant politician. Madison plays such a role in forming this country. He, he decides, hey, we actually, this Articles of Confederation in the 1780s, this isn't working. We need to redesign this country. And then he sits down for four years and reads ancient history to look at republics and confederations. How did they work? Are they flawed? Is Montesquieu correct when he says that republics can only be small? Well, if, the, if we're gonna be a big republic, how can, I, how can we work that? Then he leads the charge to have a constitutional convention. Then he leads the charge to ratify the, the uh, constitution. Remember that each state had to have a state convention to vote to discuss this new constitution and do, to approve it. But then there's one more great achievement that I think is really overlooked for Madison. And he, he was easy to overlook. He was a small guy. He suffered from some form of epilepsy. Uh, he uh, did not have a good speaking voice and he was not really a remarkable writer. And I think because of that, it is easy to overlook him. I think his great achievement is in the 1790s, recognizing, okay, you can't rely on virtue. Let's try to have a balance of interest. Let's have selfishness in one place, balance selfishness in another. Let's disperse power so greatly that the only way you can move forward in this country, the only way you can make progress is through compromise, is through building coalitions, is by coming together. And he says, partisanship is okay, faction is okay, and political parties start developing out of that uh, between him between, between him and, uh, and Jefferson in the 1790s. So I think again and again, Madison plays a key role that's not often appreciated. I really, be, the two people I really became quite fond of in writing this book were George Washington and James Madison. In both cases, the more I knew about them, the more I appreciated them. The two people whose uh, opinions, of my, my estimation of went down were John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Well, uh, it's, it's interesting because you've really picked someone out of, I would almost call it the dustbin of history. We all heard his name, but very few know anything about him and brought him forward. Uh, for the question we just asked, why am I on here because I'm a distraction? Uh, it's just uh, a reminder, Tom Ricks and I have been friends for many years and friendships go a long ways with us. Uh, this is the only thing he ever asked me to do and uh, so I thought I would pay him back for years of friendship. You don't really pay back friends, but you can certainly stand by them when something this uh, impressive is brought out, a book that's, I think, going to change the lens of how we look at ourselves today. You know, there was a, a rock and roll group out back when I was in high school and college, uh, which is in the last millennium, uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and they wrote a song, and one of the lines in it, was you when you're on the road must have a code that you can live by. And for many of us who go into the military and end up in combat, uh, the veneer of civilization can get scraped pretty thin. 
so you look for code you can live by, you look for role models. And I often wondered how did George Washington take a bunch of independent minded people who were actually rebelling against authority. We had a nasty argument with King George III and he takes Delaware watermen who take orders from nobody and Boston guys that the guys from South Carolina can't even understand. They talk a foreign language. They talk so funny up there. And Virginia grandees off plantations who uh, many of the people in New England thought were basically, uh, you know, uh, contrary to any kind of understanding of human rights and that sort of thing. How did he weld an army together that would humble the redcoats? Uh, you know, so I, I looked around and I, I had a hard time growing up finding books that talked about George Washington, the soldier, the general, uh, and how he did what he did. And you go into a fair amount of detail on this also with first principles and what they, the role they had in guiding his maturation as an officer who eventually uh, with his revolutionary army gives us a chance at this Republic. Uh, tell me why you, uh, in a book that seems mostly about politics, why you went into his generalship in such detail. Well, the first thing I would say about Washington is people tend not to see, before he was a general, he was a politician. For 15 years, he was elected and served in the House of Burgesses in colonial Virginia. And after he was a general, he was a politician as president. He, so he was a president much longer than he was a general. But his generalship is interesting to me, again, because I think like Madison, it's not been properly appreciated. Uh, a lot of historians tend to shrug and say, somehow uh, George Washington emerged from the war the victor, but he wasn't a good general because he didn't win a lot of battles. And I find that assessment just foolish because it equates winning battles with winning wars. When we all know you can win every battle and still lose the war. Uh, what amazed me about Washington is the situation he takes on, as you say, this disparate army which at the beginning, uh, he is the first soldier in the United States Army, and he has agreed to take on the world's greatest superpower with no Navy and with this army that hardly seems to get along with each other. And he himself is quite shocked. When he gets up to New England and sees the New England militiamen, he finds them rude and dirty and says so in a letter back to Genteel, Virginia. Uh, he has some real problems with them. And what I like about him, what I think is so important about him, is that he learns and adjusts. At first, he, he comes in very conventionally, thinking like an English officer, and he designs a very complex amphibious assault on the city of Boston. He's going to have some troops come around by land, he's going to have others go by boat, uh, and they're going to attack entrenched British regulars. This, as you know, would be difficult with seasoned troops, a complex land and sea attack. He doesn't have seasoned troops. He doesn't even have seasoned sergeants, non-commissioned officers. Everybody's a newcomer. It would have been a disaster, I think, had he tried to do it. And it was a disaster when he tried similar stuff in New York in late in 1776. He gets his butt kicked out of Long Island. He gets his butt kicked across Manhattan and he gets chased across New Jersey. All this time, though, he's learning, he's adjusting, he's thinking. His low point is December 1876. He actually writes privately in a letter, the game may soon be up. He may have lost this. But the whole time, he is stopping and thinking and adjusting. But look, I'm trying to tell a general about a general. I'd like to know your view of General Washington during the Revolution. What do you think? Well, as I study him, I see a man who changes almost dramatically every 12 months. He is learning in every fight. He doesn't just fight. He actually learns something from it. And he's fighting the, the, the probably the best small army, the best army in the world at that time. And yet he's able to separate himself from what would be a very impatient, aggressive style of generalship and realize it's not going to work with the troops he has and the enemy he's up against. And he's going to lose this great big gamble uh, that we're gonna set up this new country. 
uh, if he doesn't change his ways. And I've seen uh, throughout the, my study of uh, the history of war, generals who don't learn, they keep making the same mistakes and that's not George Washington. There's also a humility to him. Uh, mm -hmm. What he looks at him as this stern, uh, very difficult distant uh, personality. But in fact, if you look at how he leads, uh, he listens to other people, whether they be his French officers or his German or his Polish advisors, because in those days we needed advisors. We weren't the, uh, the best in the world. Uh, he then listens to them and learns from them. He's willing to be persuaded. He's not just listening to them in order to show that he's somehow uh, you know, uh, humble. He really is humble as a learner, and then he helps them. He always finds a way to help people if it's humanly possible to understand something, to get them socks and blankets. There's always some element of help. So he listens and he learns showing respect. He helps them so they see him as someone who's in touch with them, and then he leads. And somehow he goes through all these defeats and these retreats. That can be very hard on a military spirit. Uh, you, you've been there, Tom, you've seen it when it happened to us uh, in, in certain places. And uh, somehow he keeps it together. And so from my perspective, he has a lot to teach any officer who's going to lead free men and women and not use arrogance, but use true leadership. Uh, the kind of leadership that shows empathy, empathy being a weapon system if it's employed correctly. So I really appreciate what you did. And you actually took, for all my study of him, I, I, the, the showing that Cato was his role model in certain ways was interesting because we all need role models in this world. Uh, we need them. And I would just say in my line of work, it was, it was essential that you stay authentic, but a book like yours is going to help a lot of other people understand what they can draw from his example. Because there was nothing certain about what he was trying to accomplish. Matter of fact, most of the betting people in Las Vegas, had they been alive then, would have bet against him, I'm quite certain. Oh, a lot of Americans were betting against him. I'm, I'm interested in your comment on humility. He, it, part of, I think, his humility was he was conscious of some of his own personal vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. He knew he had a titanic temper. Uh, Brad, I think we're allowed to say this in a, in a Zoom cast. He lost his shit a couple of times uh, on the battlefield at Monmouth um, and earlier uh, in, in Manhattan. Uh, he could have a volcanic temper, but he struggled to hold it in. Later in the book, it actually erupts in a cabinet meeting. And you can just see Thomas Jefferson writing down on a transcript of Washington blowing his stack. Another uh, vulnerability of his, I think he was very conscious of, was his lack of education. And he compensates for this very well. He finds this young West Indian, Alexander Hamilton, who is brash and a brilliant writer. I love, I think I have a lot of problems with Hamilton. I think in a lot of ways he was batshit crazy, but he's a beautiful writer and the energy of his prose jumps off the page. Mm -hmm. And when you're reading supposedly Washington's dispatches, the ones that are written by Ham Hamilton just leap off the page. Yeah, I think that uh, meeting where he, he lost his uh, lost his school there was, I think he said something along the lines of, by God, I'd rather be in my grave than be the president. Uh, and probably I, not the first, the, probably not the last president to say that. Too. No, not at all. And, and I was reading a book by Susan Eisenhower about her grandfather uh, and the challenges he had at times, uh, you know, maintaining his cool. It seems like it's uh, just something that goes with the job uh, once, you, once you make president. A question, you, uh, Bradley mentioned that you go actually practical late in the book, very practical, uh, which I thought was refreshing. It's not some academician just laying out, here's a problem. Uh, you know, here's, here's when we were trying to live up to an ideal and we're not doing any more, so over to you. But you actually lay out, here's some ideas on what we can do, and one of them, uh, in the chapter that you call, what can we do? Refocus on the public good. Uh, I thought that was interesting because uh, we now have people 
who don't find common ground aren't interested in finding common ground with people they disagree with. Um, they, the, they, the score points on a fellow American to lose our respect for our fundamental friendship with each other, to have good robust arguments and then go to dinner together. Uh, those seem to be things of the past. Uh, using the founding fathers thinking uh, how could we refocus on the public good? Not just the examples you give in the book of where it ought to be, but how would we actually refocus on the common good when some people are so, uh, I would call it almost smugly satisfied to draw all their news from one organization that reinforces their position and condemns all others as being beyond the pale, somehow not worthy of listening to, learning from, helping and leading, uh, to put it in George Washington's terms. So what, what, the first thing I'd say is advice. we have spent the last 40 years with, I think, much too much of an emphasis on the market. We have made the market the god of our economy. And I don't think the founders would recognize that. The second thing is I'd say, if you want to be originalist, if you want to be constructivist and you're looking at the Constitution, there's a phrase there that occurs twice, the general welfare. We almost never talk about that. And by this, the general welfare, the founders meant the public good. And I don't think we have talked enough about that. I think, for example, this year, the one of the most fundamental forms of general welfare is public health. Yet we have had a shabby government response to the coronavirus epidemic. I feel like in the last year, we've had a national experiment what would it be like if we restarted the Articles of Confederation, which is a bunch of states running around by themselves and no central government? Because I think Donald Trump talks a lot, but actually doesn't do much aside from poke his fingers into allies' eyes um, and blow up treaties that we probably shouldn't blow up. Uh, but domestically, I don't think they had any respect for government, for the importance of government, and for ensuring the general welfare. So whether you're conservative or liberal, talking about the general welfare, I think should be the point of departure. It's right there next to common defense. We talk about common defense all the time. We know national security is important, but I don't think we understand how important the general welfare is. And that's a constitutional phrase that both left and right could focus on and could stand on in arguments. Tom, that's a, that's a great point because we, we need to find common ground so we can go back to governing. Um, we, you know, governing's all about unity. Uh, you can't govern and just be anti things. You can do that in an election. Uh, it's not great, uh, but some people have used that tactic. But to govern, you have to be for something. What, what lessons uh, besides looking for out for the common good, what lessons do you want readers to come away from something that you gave years of your life researching, studying, and, and writing on? Uh, what, what do you want the book to incite or result in? I think I would actually go back to a phrase I've heard you use in speeches, and it's the American experiment. And it's a phrase that goes back, as you know, to George Washington's farewell address, that this country is an experiment and we could still blow it. Uh, we may be blowing it right now if we're not careful. And it's more fragile in some ways than it appears to be, yet more resilient than we might think. I think if the founders looked at us now they would be so pleased that this country is held together and this constitution amended as they plan for it to be, has held together for, for, for centuries. Uh, but we need to be careful that we don't drift into being a democratic oligarchy that has the trappings of law, but really is no longer a democracy. You know, it's interesting you bring this point up, uh, Tom. And if we look at the uh, Articles of Confederation, they don't work. We go to the Constitution. Uh, it's uh, immediately when Ben Franklin walks out of the Constitutional Hall, he's asked by a lady, what is it to be a monarchy or a republic? And he says, a republic if you can keep it. 
1814, uh, Francis Scott Keyes held on a British warship as the fleet pounds Fort McHenry. And he asked the same question in a poem that we put to music. And he says, uh, does that star spangled banner still wave uh, through the battle? Uh, a few years after that, Robert Lee, 60 years later, Robert E. Lee, or excuse me, uh, Abraham Lincoln, knowing that Robert E. Lee was beaten at Gettysburg, uh, said these troops died here to determine if a country of the people, by the people, for the people, can long uh, stand on its own. So the question is out there, but perhaps we have been so prosperous, so fortunate for so long, and we are trying to make a more perfect union uh, to a point that we've forgotten that we've still got a pretty good deal going in terms of the ability to change our forward direction that we actually were given thanks to what you have studied here by these founding fathers a way if we don't get it right we can actually make it right make it a more perfect union bradley you're on now and why don't we shift over to some questions from our audience since i've pretty much uh dominated the q a so far thank you all right, um, feel free, uh, General Mattis, to jump in. Um, actually, this first question uh, is to, to both of you, uh, Tom and Jim. It's from Sean um, Schatzel. Uh, excuse me if I mispronounce some names here. Uh, the question is that uh, the one issue that has been highlighted over the past few years is how our government functions in so many ways through agreed upon norms as opposed to written laws. Was this an intentional choice by our founders? If so, was it an idea they took from ancient cultures? Good question. Uh, they, I, I think the norms developed out of the process. Uh, for example, one key norm is General Washington stepping down after two terms as president. Uh, that became a norm. It was violated, of course, by Franklin Delano Roosevelt because he, he thought the country in the middle of World War II should not switch presidencies or going into World War II should not switch presidencies. Uh, but yes, I think one thing that's been surprising is how much norms have developed around the practice of government. Uh, it did make me think also, we need to revisit whether some of these norms need to be written into law. Uh, and we can change these things. I mean, if you go back and read the records of the, of, the, of the Constitutional Convention, they were making it up as they went along. At one point they're discussing, should the presidency be a multi-headed body? Should there be three people as president? They say, no, it really didn't work out in Rome. We shouldn't do that. Uh, at another point, they discussed whether senators and presidency should be for life, uh, a view that Alexander Hamilton held. Uh, something I've been stewing about lately is I think the Supreme Court should have terms, should not be life service, should be perhaps 14 to 18 years. And you get one term and you're out and you can go out and do something else. Uh, the prospect of having some of these people sit in the Supreme Court for 50 years, I find frightening. I, I would only add, uh, this shows the value of doing research over years like Tom has done to get that sort of immediate response. I would just point out more broadly that what we have is uh, we have the opportunity to do this because of what the founding fathers set up. We didn't always have it right in our history. And it's not only slavery where we had it wrong, uh, but we have a remarkable ability to get it right. And these are the kind of things we have to look at. Do we need to codify some of these norms and put them into law and, and make certain that these are, are what we want to stand by? Are these the things that we stand for and some of the things we will not stand for? But uh, I, think, I think it's a very healthy re recommendation. I think we ought to have a, have a national dialogue, maybe even a structured dialogue on it. David Sewell asks, uh, what parallels were there between populism in Rome and Greece and US populism? And do the founders' attitudes uh, towards populism have application to our situation today? I'm gonna beg off on that. That's a, a huge question and it's over my head in a lot of ways. I think I would have to think through Shays' Rebellion and the Whiskey Rebellion in those terms. Uh, generally, I would say the Southern founders had a real um, 
fear of populism, but in some ways, Northerners had it even more, uh, partly because as Gordon Wood says, uh, the Northerners had seen populism up close. They had seen much more democracy in things like town meetings than the Southerners had. Uh, and especially coming off of Shays' Rebellion, there was a real feeling that we needed to do a better job on domestic stability. And Shays' Rebellion is commemorated in the Constitution in the phrase about domestic tranquility and giving the federal government the ability to ensure domestic tranquility if a state cannot do it. Yeah, I think to Tocqueville's point about, uh, he was obviously very influenced by, by the ancients, uh, the classic uh, Greek and Roman uh, scholars, and he saw the danger that populism could bring to a democracy, to a republic, uh, that it could in, in effect become even like a dictatorship in its application. Uh, so I, I think it's a danger that has been there. We've been through these raucous periods uh, before, uh, but it, it may be something that uh, is more influenced by the, by the mob, frankly, than it is by the founding fathers' uh, views of the, the, the classical approaches to governing. One thing I'd like to add to that is they had different views. Thomas Jefferson kind of uh, liked the mob. Um, but Jefferson is unlike a lot of the other uh, people of the revolutionary era in that he is more Greek than Roman. He's much more into Epicurus than any Roman philosophy or any Stoicism. Uh, and he is much more of a fan of Athens than most uh, of, of his peers. He really liked Athens at a time when uh, Sparta was seen as a much better example than Athens. For example, Samuel Adams, John Adams' cousin, said Sparta, said Boston uh, should become a Sparta on the sea here. Uh, another uh, audience member wants to know uh, whether you can talk about the founders' concerns uh, about a divided populace. Any ancient examples? Well, yeah. I mean, they were so focused on faction so worried about faction that I think they focused on it too much. They thought that the two things that brought down the Roman Republic were factionalism and corruption. And to most of them, that meant we can't have factions. That faction, that is becoming politically split off into groups is the beginning for them of treason. And this is one reason that John Adams goes nuts as president. Uh, he says, I'm president now. Sure, I'm not George Washington, but nobody can criticize me. And the newspaper men who criticize me, there are about 160 newspapers in the United States at that point. He puts 25 newspaper editors under indictment, and I think 12 wound up in jail. Uh, in Manhattan, Thomas Greenleaf has an anti-Adams newspaper. They're going to charge him. He dies of smallpox. So they're going to charge his widow, she gets sick, and so they charge his printer. Adams really wanted to shut down all criticism to the presidency because of this fear of faction. So I think they, in some ways, were more worried about division than they should be. And that's one reason, again, that Madison comes along and says, hey, dudes, it's not a bug, it's a feature. In the same way, Madison says gridlock is not a bug, but a feature. I'm going to disperse power so much across the system, between states and the federal government, between three branches of federal government, between two houses within the legislative branch, I'm gonna disperse power so much that if you people can't get your act together and make deals and, and form coalitions, then you're gonna have gridlock. And he likes that idea. It's gonna stop people from imposing their views on others. And it's gonna force them to find some, some way forward with others. Uh, here's a question for both of you um, from Eric Buck. Uh, how do you think the founders would see our current situation with states' rights and, uh, and control with the Senate and Electoral Congress? Uh, do you think um, that they think we would have evolved into more of a cohesive nation by now? I'll defer to you. Um, I don't think they wanted us to be a cohesive nation. I think they wanted us to have 
a spirit of collaboration. I think they wanted us to share some values, but I think they actually wanted to diffuse the power out to the states, all the powers other than the specific ones they granted the federal government intentionally to keep the country uh, governed principally locally. I think they saw a strength to local governance and the more that people felt that governance was close to them, the less alienated they would be. Remember, they'd had a very bad argument with King George III. Uh, they didn't want to have a replacement King George III. These were people who fought for freedom. So I think they would be very comfortable uh, with the diffusion of power. They might even be uh, concerned about the amount of power now accrued to the federal government uh, versus what they had in mind, I think, uh, back when they wrote the Constitution in the first couple administrations. I defer to you on that part, Tom, but I, I think they'd be very comfortable with this. One thing I'd add is that not all of them uh, didn't want a king. Alexander Hamilton wanted a president for life, which is basically like a, a king. One thing I think they would look at today if they came back, they'd say, geez, we didn't expect the, the divergence between states to be so large. One thing I would love to see considered when General Madison and I have our constitutional convention is whether the one third largest states should have three senators, the middle third should have two senators, and the smallest third should have one senator. This would be much more democratic and it has a parallel in some of the ancient Greek confederacies. Uh, another question, uh, this one from Dylan Lord to both of you. Uh, what, what's your advice to uh, young civil servants at, uh, or military leaders uh, when uh, we're challenged on our first principles. That's a softball right there for General Mattis. Well, the first point I would make is that it's a privilege to and a duty to, to serve in the country, whether you're, you're serving in a local governance uh, situation, the school district, the city council, or you're serving in the Peace Corps or the Marine Corps, or you're serving in federal government it's a privilege, it, it's also a duty. But the thing to remember is what Tom brought up from uh, President Washington's first, I thought it was his inauguration, Tom, when he first refers to America as an experiment. And uh, it's an experiment that we all have to work on and every generation has to take what they find imperfect and try to make it a more perfect union. So the job is never going to be done it's always going to be hard work because we set it up with all these different power centers, but it's noble work. It is truly noble work. If you put your effort into this, if you throw your passion into it, if you're willing to listen to those who disagree with you, recognizing a broken clock is right twice a day, and they might have something to offer. If you're willing to do that, you'll never be laying on a couch at age 55, paying somebody to reassure you that you actually did something with your life. This experiment that we call America uh, is only going to work if we get the young folks who if looking at the leadership right now in the country over the last 10, 15 years, they would be in many cases wondering why they should go in, go in, go in and fight for you. You don't have to do it for 45 years like me, do it for four years, go off in the Peace Corps, go off in the diplomatic corps, work in the intelligence services serve on your school board, but roll up your sleeves, pitch in and work on it and make it a better country. That's not any resentment uh, focused on the past. It's based on a commitment and a responsibility to the next generation for each one to improve on it. We are so fortunate to have the opportunity to do so. Don't squander it, don't give it up. Don't sit on the sidelines eating popcorn, watching your favorite news channel, cursing the people who disagree with you. Get out there and work on it. Remember the general welfare. Perfect. Another question. Uh, what are your thoughts on the American education system with regard to history textbooks and how they cover the founding uh, of this country? I got nothing for you, General, General Mattis. Um, I don't know. I go to a lot of college campuses, probably a dozen a year before COVID. Uh, and I look at the way history is taught now. Uh, I believe history should show the good, the bad, and the ugly, because that's how we know how we're going to improve 
it doesn't give you all the answers about the future. What it does is it gives you the questions you should be asking as you guide yourself. <clears throat> but that said, uh, hyphenated history, uh, there does not seem to be a way to teach history today that creates any affection uh, for what this country is uh, and its good points. The generosity of the country, uh, the effort of so many to make it better in each generation. And I think we need to teach more how women's suffragettes made it happen, how the civil rights leaders made it happen. We need to have these role models brought out in the kind of terms, Tom, that you've brought the founding fathers out as role models because these are enduring issues in human nature. And I'm convinced that we can teach history a lot better. I will say that Graham Allison up in, uh, up in Yale or Harvard, excuse me, is doing a very good job with what he calls applied history. And I think there are ways for history to become something other than memorizing dates or reading little niche histories that seem to do nothing about creating common cause, the good, the, the, the kind of the approach where we look out for each other rather than always getting off in different tribes and say, this is the way we're gonna make the United States work. We've got to come back together history has a role to play. I agree, but I would add, remember the dissenters are the people who move the country forward often, and they are sometimes regarded as little tribes. You mentioned the civil rights movement, and I know we're supposed to um, mention at the end what book we're currently reading, but I got to mention it now because it's on point. I am currently reading the uh, papers of Martin Luther King. Uh, there are seven volumes so far, and I'm making my way through the whole thing, partly because I want to understand how the civil rights movement uh, really, I think, redeemed this country in the 1960s. The 1960s gets trashed a lot lately, but the 50s and the 60s moved this country so much forward uh, in ending in most regards the second class citizenship status of black Americans. I say most regards because I think the police really need to change in this country. I think, um, especially, I've been worried by this. Um, since 9-11, I find the police have become more arrogant, hubristic, and expecting a kind of deference that I don't recall them expecting from white Americans, but I expect they long have demanded it. I know they long have demanded it from black Americans. And I really think we need to, not defund the police, but reform the police. Uh, General Master, do you want to say something about what you're reading? Uh, I'm studying reconciliation and I'm using uh, Ulysses Grant as president, uh, his time. I'm studying uh, Nelson Mandela's effort to bring post apartheid mm -hmm. South Africa back together and I'm studying Mannerheim's efforts in Finland. He had to do it twice in his lifetime, once in uh, 1918 to 22, and once in 1944 to 46. I'm trying to find what are the common threads for how you bring uh, societies back together after to racial hatred in South Africa or communist versus fascist uh, tendencies in Finland because of World War II. Uh, that sort of thing. I'm trying to figure out what are the common threads and what can I find in Ulysses Grant's presidency that shows the groundbreaking efforts he took in order to try to bring us forward along these lines. So uh, I'm not there yet, but that's what I'm reading on. General Mattis, I gotta say, uh, look also to Martin Luther King, James Lawson, and other people in the civil rights movement. That formally in their philosophy, the last step in any civil rights campaign was, re was reconciliation. It was their phase four, to use the US military term. Sir King that put me on this journey actually reading oh. about him. So you're out Better of- Better for Birmingham right. jail? He, he, yeah, right, and, uh, and there, well, we'll talk later, Tom. There's some good stuff on that too. Okay. Uh, well, that's that brings us to the end of our hour. Um, uh, thanks to, to both of you for a terrific discussion, uh, reminding us of, uh, the foundations uh, of our country and all the work that's still left to do to uh, uh, make us uh, truly a more perfect union. Um, to everyone watching, 
a reminder that you can find a link in the chat column to buy uh, Tom's terrific book, First Principles. Uh, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. From us here at Politics and Prose, 